The origins of this universe and life on Earth, as discussed in the textbooks I have read, are very inaccurate. Since you serve your government as a medical personnel, your duties require that you understand biological entities, so I am sure that you will appreciate the value of the material I will share with you today. The text of books I have been given on subjects related to the function of life forms contain information that is based on false memories, inaccurate observation, missing data, unproven theories, and superstition. For example, just a few hundred years ago, your physicians practiced bloodletting as a means to release supposed ill humors from the body in an attempt to relieve or heal a wide variety of physical and mental afflictions. Although this has been corrected somewhat, many barbarisms are still being practiced in the name of medical science. In addition to the application of incorrect theories concerning biological engineering, many primary errors that Earth scientists make are the result of an ignorance of the nature and relative importance of ISBEs as the source of energy and intelligence which animate every life form. Although it is not a priority of the domain to intervene in the affairs of Earth, the Domain Communications Office has authorized me to provide you with some information in an effort to provide a more accurate and complete understanding of these things and thereby enable you to discover more effective solutions to the unique problems you face on Earth. The correct information about the origins of biological entities has been erased from your mind, as well as from the minds of your mentors. In order to help you regain your own memory, I will share with you some factual material concerning the origin of biological entities. I asked Errol if she was referring to the subject of evolution. Errol said, no, not exactly. You will find evolution mentioned in the ancient Vedic hymns. The Vedic texts are like folk tales or common wisdoms and superstitions gathered throughout the systems of the domain. These were compiled into verses like a book of rhymes. For every statement of truth, the verses contain as many half-truths, reversals of truth, and fanciful imaginings, blended without qualification or distinction. The theory of evolution assumes that the motivational source of energy that animates every life form does not exist. It assumes that the inanimate object or chemical concoction can suddenly become alive or animate accidentally or spontaneously. Or perhaps an electrical discharge into a pool of chemical ooze will magically spawn a self-animated entity. There is no evidence whatsoever that this is true, simply because it is not true. Dr. Frankenstein did not really resurrect the dead into a marauding monster, except in the imagination of the Isby who wrote a fictitious story one dark and stormy night. No Western scientist ever stopped to consider who, what, where, when, or how this animation happens. Complete ignorance, denial, or unawareness of the spirit as the source of life force required to animate inanimate objects or cellular tissue is the sole cause of failures in Western medicine. In addition, evolution does not occur accidentally. It requires a great deal of technology which must be manipulated under the careful supervision of ISBEs. Very simple examples are seen in the modification of farm animals or in the breeding of dogs. However, the notion that human biological organisms evolved naturally from earlier ape-like forms is incorrect. No physical evidence will ever be uncovered to substantiate the notion that modern humanoid bodies evolved on this planet. The reason is simple. The idea that human bodies evolved spontaneously from the primordial ooze of chemical interactivity in the dim mists of time is nothing more than a hypnotic lie instilled by the amnesia operation to prevent your recollection of the true origins of mankind. Factually, humanoid bodies have existed in various forms throughout the universe for trillions of years. This was compounded by the fact that the Vedic hems were brought to Earth 8,200 years ago by the Domain Expeditionary Force. While they were based in the Himalaya Mountains, the verses were taught to some of the local humans who memorized them. However, I should note that this was not an authorized activity for the crew of the Domain installation, although I am sure it seemed like an innocent diversion for them at the time. The verses were passed along verbally from one generation to the next for thousands of years in the foothills and eventually spread throughout India. 
No one in the domain credits any of the material in the Vedic hymns as factual material, any more than you would use Grimm's fairy tales as a guide for rearing children. However, on a planet where all of the Isbis have had their memory erased, one can understand how these tales and fantasies could be taken seriously. Unfortunately, the humans who learned the Vedic verses passed them along to others, saying that they came from the gods. Eventually, the content of the verses were adopted verbatim as truth. The euphemistic and metaphorical content of the Veda were accepted and practiced as dogmatic fact. The philosophy of the verses were ignored, and the verses became the genesis of nearly every religious practice on the planet, especially Hinduism. As an officer, pilot, and engineer of the domain, I must always assume a very pragmatic point of view. I could not be effective or accomplish my missions if I were to use philosophical dogma or rhetoric as my operations manual. Therefore, our discussion of history is based on actual events that occurred long before any Isbis arrived on Earth, and long before the old empire came into power. I can relate part of this history from personal experience. Many billions of years ago, I was a member of a very large biological laboratory in a galaxy far from this one. It was called the Arcadia Regeneration Company. I was a biological engineer working with a large staff of technicians. It was our business to manufacture and supply new life forms to uninhabited planets. There were millions of star systems with millions of inhabitable planets in the region at that time. There were many other biological laboratory companies at that time also, each of them specializing in producing different kinds of life forms, depending on the class of the planet being populated. Over a long span of time, these laboratories developed a vast catalog of species throughout the galaxies. The majority of basic genetic material is common to all species of life. Therefore, most of their work was concerned with manipulating alterations of the basic genetic pattern to produce variations of life forms that would be suitable inhabitants for various planetary classes. The Arcadia Regeneration Company specialized in mammals for forested areas and birds for tropical regions. Our marketing staff negotiated contracts with various planetary governments and independent buyers from all over the universe. The technicians created animals that were compatible with the variations in climate, atmospheric and terrestrial density, and chemical content. In addition, we were paid to integrate our specimens with biological organisms engineered by other companies already living on a planet. In order to do this, our staff was in communication with other companies who created life forms. There were industry trade shows, publications, and a variety of other information supplied through an association that coordinated related projects. As you can imagine, our research required a great deal of interstellar travel to conduct planetary surveys. This is when I learned my skills as a pilot. The data gathered was accumulated in huge computer databases and evaluated by biological engineers. A computer is an electronic device that serves as an artificial brain or complex calculating machine. It is capable of storing information, making computations, solving problems, and performing mechanical functions. In most of the galactic systems of the universe, very large computers are commonly used to run the routine administration, mechanical services, and maintenance activities of an entire planet or planetary system. Based on the survey data gathered, designs and artistic renderings were made for new creatures. Some designs were sold to the highest bidder. Other life forms were created to meet the customized requests of our clients. The design and technical specifications were passed along an assembly line through a series of cellular, chemical, and mechanical engineers to solve the various problems. It was their job to integrate all of the component factors into a workable, functional, and aesthetic finished product. Prototypes of these creatures were then produced and tested in artificially created environments. Imperfections were worked out, modifications made, and eventually the new life form was endowed or animated with a life force or spiritual energy before being introduced into the actual planetary environment for final testing. 
After a new life form was introduced, we monitored the interaction of these biological organisms with the planetary environment and with other indigenous life forms. Conflicts resulting from the interaction between incompatible organisms were resolved through negotiation between ourselves and other companies. The negotiations usually resulted in compromises requiring further modification to our creatures, or to theirs, or both. This is part of a science or art you call eugenics. In some cases, changes were made in the planetary environment, but not often, as planet building is much more complex than making changes to an individual life form. Coincidentally, a friend and engineer with whom I used to work at the Acadia Regeneration Company, a long time after I left the company, told me that one of the projects they contracted to do, in more recent times, was to deliver life forms to Earth to replenish them after a war in this region of the galaxy devastated most of the life on the planets in this region of space. This would have been about 70 million years ago. The skill required to modify the planet into an ecologically interactive environment that will support billions of diverse species was an immense undertaking. Specialized consultants from nearly every biotechnology company in the galaxy were brought in to help with the project. What you see now on Earth is the huge variety of life forms left behind. Your scientists believe that the fallacious theory of evolution is an explanation for the existence of all of the life forms here. The truth is that all life forms on this and any other planet in this universe were created by companies like ours. How else can you explain the millions of completely divergent and unrelated species of life on the land and in the oceans of this planet? How else can you explain the source of spiritual animation which defines every living creature? To say it is the work of God is far too broad. Every Isby has many names and faces in many times and places. Every Isby is a God. When they inhabit a physical object, they are the source of life. For example, there are millions of species of insects. About 350,000 of these are species of beetles. There may be as many as 100 million species of life forms on Earth at any given time. In addition, there are many times more extinct species of life on Earth than there are living life forms. Some of these will be rediscovered in the fossil or geological records of Earth. The current theory of evolution of life forms on Earth does not consider the phenomena of biological diversity. Evolution by natural selection is science fiction. One species does not accidentally or randomly evolve to become another species, as the Earth textbooks indicate, without manipulation of genetic material by an ISBE. A simple example of ISBE intervention is the selective breeding of a species on Earth. Within the past few hundred years, several hundred dog breeds and hundreds of varieties of pigeons and dozens of koi fish have been evolved in just a few years, beginning with only one original breed. Without active intervention by ISBEs, biological organisms rarely change. The development of an animal like the duck-billed platypus required a lot of very clever engineering to combine the body of a beaver with the bill of a duck and make a mammal that lays eggs. Undoubtedly, some wealthy client placed a special order for it as a gift or curious amusement. I am sure the laboratory of some biological company worked on it for years to make it a self-replicating life form. The notion that the creation of any life form could have resulted from a coincidental chemical interaction moldering up from some primordial ooze is beyond absurdity. Factually, some organisms on Earth, such as proteobacteria, are modifications of a phylum designed primarily for star type 3 class C planets. In other words, the domain designation for a planet with an anaerobic atmosphere nearest a large, intensely hot blue star, such as those in the constellation of Orion's belt in this galaxy. Creating life forms is very complex, highly technical work for ISBEs who specialize in this field. Genetic anomalies are very baffling to Earth biologists who have had their memory erased. Unfortunately, the false memory implantations of the old empire prevent Earth scientists from observing obvious anomalies. The greatest technical challenge of biological organisms was the invention of self-regeneration, or sexual reproduction. 
It was invented as the solution to the problem of having to continually manufacture replacement creatures for those that had been destroyed and eaten by other creatures. Planetary governments did not want to keep buying replacement animals. The idea was contrived trillions of years ago as a result of a conference held to resolve arguments between the disputing vested interests within the biotechnology industry. The infamous Council of Yumi Krum was responsible for coordinating creature production. A compromise was reached, after certain members of the Council were strategically bribed or murdered, to author an agreement which resulted in the biological phenomenon which we now call the food chain. The idea that a creature would need to consume the body of another life form as an energy source was offered as a solution by one of the biggest companies in the biological engineering business. They specialized in creating insects and flowering plants. The connection between the two is obvious. Nearly every flowering plant requires a symbiotic relationship with an insect in order to propagate. The reason is obvious. Both the bugs and the flowers were created by the same company. Unfortunately, this same company also had a division which created parasites and bacteria. The name of the company, roughly translated into English, would be Bugs and Blossoms. They wanted to justify the fact that the only valid purpose of the parasitic creatures they manufactured was to aid the decomposition of organic material. There was a very limited market for such creatures at that time. In order to expand their business, they hired a big public relations firm and a powerful group of political lobbyists to glorify the idea that life forms should feed from other life forms. They invented a scientific theory to use as a promotion gimmick. The theory was that all creatures needed to have food as a source of energy. Before that, none of the life forms being manufactured required any external energy. Animals did not eat other animals for food, but consumed sunlight, minerals, or vegetable matter only. Of course, Bugs and Blossoms went into the business of designing and manufacturing carnivores. Before long, so many animals were being eaten as food that the problem of replenishing them became very difficult. As a solution, Bugs and Blossoms proposed, with the help of some strategically placed bribes in high places, that other companies begin using sexual reproduction as the basis for replenishing life forms. Bugs and Blossoms was the first company to develop blueprints for sexual reproduction, of course. As expected, the patent licenses for the biological engineering process required to implant stimulus response mating, cellular division, and pre-programmed growth patterns for self-regenerating animals were owned by Bugs and Blossoms too. Through the next few million years, laws were passed that required that these programs be purchased by the other biological technology companies. These were required to be imprinted into the cellular design of all existing life forms. It became a very expensive undertaking for other biotechnology companies to make such an awkward and impractical idea work. This led to corruption and downfall of the entire industry. Ultimately, the food and sex idea completely ruined the biotechnology industry, including bugs and blossoms. The entire industry faded away as the market for manufactured life forms disappeared. Consequently, when a species became extinct, there is no way to replace them because the technology of creating new life forms has been lost. Obviously, none of this technology was ever known on Earth and probably never will be. There are still computer files on some planets far from here which record the procedures for biological engineering. Possibly the laboratories and computers still exist somewhere. Therefore, you can understand why it is so important for the domain to protect the dwindling number of creatures left on Earth. The core concept behind sexual reproduction technology was the invention of a chemical electronic interaction called cyclical stimulus response generators. This is a programmed genetic mechanism which causes a seemingly spontaneous recurring impulse to reproduce. The same technique was later adapted and applied to biological flesh bodies, including Homo sapiens. Another important mechanism used in the reproductive process, especially with Homo sapiens type bodies, is the implantation of a chemical electrical trigger mechanism in the body. The trigger, which attracts isbies to inhabit a human body or any kind of flesh body, is the use of artificially imprinted electronic wave, which uses aesthetic pain to attract the isbi. 
Every trap in the universe, including those used to capture Isbees who remain free, is baited with an aesthetic electronic wave. The sensations caused by the aesthetic wavelength are more attractive to an Isbee than any other sensation. When the electronic waves of pain and beauty are combined together, this causes the Isbee to get stuck in the body. The reproductive trigger used for lesser life forms, such as cattle and other mammals, is triggered by chemicals emitted from the scent glands, combined with reproductive chemical electrical impulses stimulated by testosterone or estrogen. The debilitating impact and addiction to the sexual aesthetic pain electronic wave is the reason that the ruling class of the domain do not inhabit flesh bodies. This is also why officers of the domain forces only use doll bodies. This wave has proven to be the most effective trapping device ever created in the history of the universe, as far as I know. The civilizations of the domain and the old empire both depend on this device to recruit and maintain a workforce of Isbees who inhabit flesh bodies on planets and installations. These Isbees are the working class beings who do all of the slavish, manual, undesirable work on planets. As I mentioned, there is a very highly regimented and fixed hierarchy or class system for all Isbees throughout the old empire and the domain as follows. The highest class are free Isbees. That is, they are not restricted to the use of any type of body and may come and go at will provided that they do not destroy or interfere with the social, economic, or political structure. Below this class are many strata of limited ISBEs, who may or may not use a body from time to time. Limitations are imposed on each ISB regarding range of power, ability, and mobility they can exercise. Below these are the doll body classes, to which I belong. Nearly all space officers and crew members of spacecraft are required to travel through intergalactic space. Therefore, they are each equipped with a body manufactured from lightweight, durable materials. Various body types have been designed to facilitate specialized functions. Some bodies have accessories, such as interchangeable tools, or apparatus for activities such as maintenance, mining, chemical management, navigation, and so forth. There are many gradations of this body type which also serve as an insignia of rank. Below these are the soldier class. The soldiers are equipped with a myriad of weapons and specialized armaments designed to detect, combat, and overwhelm any imaginable foe. Some soldiers are issued mechanical bodies. Most soldiers are merely remote controlled robots with no class designation. The lower classes are limited to flesh bodies. Of course, it is not possible for these to travel through space for obvious reasons. Fundamentally, flesh bodies are far too fragile to endure the stresses of gravity, temperature extremes, radiation exposure, atmospheric chemicals, and the vacuum of space. There are also the obvious logistical inconveniences of food, defecation, sleep, atmospheric elements, and air pressure required by flesh bodies that doll bodies do not require. Most flesh bodies will suffocate in only a few minutes without a specific combination of atmospheric chemicals. After two or three days, the bacteria which live internally and externally on the body cause severe odors to be emitted. Odors of any kind are not acceptable in a space vessel. The first development of biological bodies began in this universe about 74 trillion years ago. It rapidly became a fad for Isbees to create and inhabit various types of bodies for an assortment of nefarious reasons, especially for amusement. This is to experience various physical sensations vicariously through the body. Since that time, there has been a continuing de-evolution in the relationship of Isbees to bodies. As Isbees continued to play around with these bodies, Certain tricks were introduced to cause Isbees to get trapped inside a body so they were unable to leave again. This was done primarily by making bodies that appeared sturdy but were actually very fragile. An Isbee, using their natural power to create energy, accidentally injured a body when contacting it. This Isbee was remorseful about having injured this fragile body. The next time they encountered a body, they began to be careful with them. In so doing, the Isbi would withdraw or minimize their own power so as not to injure the body. 
A very long and treacherous history of this kind of trickery, combined with similar misadventures, eventually resulted in a large number of Isbees becoming permanently trapped in bodies. Of course, this became a profitable enterprise for some Isbees, who took advantage of this situation to make slaves of others. The resulting enslavement progressed over trillions of years and continues today. Ultimately, the dwindling ability of Isbees to maintain a personal state of operational freedom and ability to create energy resulted in the vast and carefully guarded hierarchy or class system. Using bodies as a symbol of each class is used throughout the old empire as well as the domain. The vast majority of Isbees throughout the galaxies of this universe inhabit some form of flesh body. The structure, appearance, operation, and habitat of these bodies vary according to the gravity, atmosphere, and climatic conditions of the planet they inhabit. Body types are predetermined largely by the type and size of the star around which the planet revolves, the distance from the star, the geological as well as the atmospheric components of the planet. On the average, these stars and planets fall into gradients of classification which are fairly standard throughout the universe. For example, Earth is identified roughly as a Sun Type 12 Class 7 planet. That is a heavy gravity, nitrogen oxygen atmosphere planet with biological life forms in proximity to a single, yellow, medium size, low radiation sun or Type 12 star. The proper designations are difficult to translate accurately due to the extreme limitations of astronomical nomenclature in the English language. There are as many varieties of life forms as there are grains of sands on the beach. You can imagine how many different creatures and types of bodies have been manufactured by the millions of companies, such as Bugs and Blossoms, for all of the myriad planetary systems during the course of 74 trillion years. Matilda O'Donnell McElroy Personal Note When Errol finished telling me this story, there was a long, silent pause while I muddled through all this in my mind. Had Errol been reading science fiction books and fantasy stories during the night? Why would she tell me something so incredibly far-fetched? If there had not been a 40-inch tall alien with gray skin and three fingers on each hand and foot sitting directly across from me, I would not have believed a single word of it. In retrospect, over the 60 years since Errol gave me this information, Earth doctors have begun to develop some of the biological engineering technology that Errol told me about right here on Earth. Heart bypasses, cloning, test tube babies, organ transplants, plastic surgery, genes, chromosomes, and so forth. One thing is very sure. I have never looked at a bug or flower the same way since then, not to mention my religious belief in Genesis.